Hey, somebody's got to tell the mariachi band to leave. You did? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to the Professional Noticer. Here, you and I will use common sense and all the wisdom we can muster to move beyond what is true and go all the way to the truth, creating measurable results for people like you and families like yours. No longer a member of the amateur ranks, I am the Professional Noticer. Are you okay? Yeah, sure. Yes, sir? Yes, sir. Now, did you say yes, sir? I think he said, yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. And I know our topics seem to vary wildly at times, but it's because the things you care about most are often greatly affected by the things you care about least. Therefore, we'll field questions about business and spiritual issues and popular culture and occasionally tackle the odd conundrum like... If builders are afraid to have a 13th floor, why aren't publishers afraid to have a chapter 11? (laughs) My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or coach. I want to help you live the life you would live if all your toughest questions were answered. The Professional Notice are sponsored this week by our friends at Tucker ATV. Tucker ATV carries every make and model of Polaris ATVs and the big player side-by-sides, the Ranger Crew, which is the big one. Smooth ride. The Ranger Crew uh, is just the Rolls Royce of off-road vehicles. And, and you have to see the showroom at Tucker ATV. Taxidermy, antique displays, and a porch inside the place. This porch is just unbelievable. It's, it's got a swing set and, and comfortable chairs and free coffee and a huge television set. You should probably move in. But uh, more later, just remember Highway 43 North in Jackson, Alabama, Tucker ATV, the small town business with the national reputation. All right, guess what? The Professional Noticer now has actual listeners in 78 countries. We just added Nigeria. Wow. Hey, Nigeria. Just so you know, observations and answers are what we do here. We're uh, glad to welcome you aboard. And, and I deliver these observations, but you got to provide the questions. We need questions from you. Questions are a critical component of the person you and I aspire to become. And, and the person who uh, never asks a question either knows everything or knows nothing. So write me. The email is the professional noticer at andyandrews.com or call 1 800 726 Andy. And listen, if we use your question, the professional noticer will send you your choice of the Guided Traveler Experience, which is over eight hours of live video seminar that I did in Orlando at SeaWorld and other very cool places. Or you could choose 100-Year Parenting. This is a collection of 53 videos, each between 10 and 20 minutes. And it's life-changing, but very fun stuff. And a lot of college football coaching staffs use this, uh, a lot of uh, organizations, um, just a ton of people, and I think you'll love it. Hey, let's get to it. Okay, this uh, this week, our first question is from Wanda. She's from Mississippi. Let's listen. Hey, Andy, this is Wanda from Mississippi. Listen, my 15-year-old daughter just suffered her first heartbreak. She and her boyfriend have been dating for about three months, and she's, she's just really upset. And I want to make sure that I guide her the correct path through this situation. You know, how do I convince her that the world's not coming to an end? She's young. She's got plenty of time to find real love. And, you know, lasting love's a rare thing. And and actually right now at her age and stage in life, dating shouldn't be so serious. So any tips or recommendations on how to guide her, Andy? I really appreciate it. Thank you. Wanda, hey, thank you so much for the question. And uh, first of all, you're from Mississippi. And so I'm really glad that my wife, Polly, is not here right now. Because if Polly was here, she would just take over and talk to you for like five hours because both of you are from Mississippi. Uh, You know, anytime we're walking around, meet somebody from Mississippi, I'm like, oh, no, oh, 
Oh, please. You know, because this is just going to take forever. Uh, I know you guys are very proud of your state, um, but I guess, you know, being from Alabama, uh, you know, it's just kind of a national rivalry that goes on in my own house between myself and my wife. Okay, your daughter. Ah, I know how that was. Do you remember? I know, I know you remember, right? How it was to be 14 or 15 years old and have somebody break up with you. If you're a guy, you remember, do you remember this? I just want to be friends. I want to be just friends. Oh, I hated that. I hated that. Uh, you know, for the first 10 years of marriage, I expected Polly to come to me and go, I would like to be just friends. I had so many people say that. So many girls say that when I was growing up. So I know how your daughter feels. We all know how your daughter feels. I, I don't know anybody that hasn't been, you know, had their heart broken at one time. And I know, you, you know, you, you say that um, she has just su suffered her first heartbreak. So I... I am assuming that was probably her first dating experience because when you're that age, whether you're the one breaking up or whether you're the one being broken up with, it's agonizing. You know, when you're 15 years old, it's hard to think and realize there is anything beyond your life. <laughs> you know? I mean, do you remember being 15 and and the center of the universe was kind of your head and everything radiating out from your head, That I, it was just something else. But that, even your parents and your friends, I mean, but that all revolved around you and your thoughts and, and how you felt. I, I mean, it was nothing we consciously did, but... When you're 15, it's hard to imagine life at 30 being very much different from what you experienced at 15, it, because you don't have the experience to imagine what life at 30 would be. And so it's it's a it's a tough situation that your daughter is in, and a tough situation that you're in, Wanda, as her mom, you, you want her to feel better, and you want her to have some perspective about the situation, and and you can give that. But I, I think, you know, I think it's important that we understand that we felt that way, and, and what that felt like, and to be able to help her to help her gain perspective, you, you say any tips or recommendations on how to guide her. You know, the the thing she needs more than anything is perspective, and it's the one thing that most 15-year-olds lack. I know I did. And so so to to help her with that, you know, you, you probably want, I'm just thinking here, you probably want to explain and, and explain it in a way that that you give her, you know, grace for not understanding it. Okay, I, I, really, because how can somebody? I mean, I can imagine life as a, you know, a, a ninety year old person. I guess, but I, I don't really know what that feels like. I don't, you know, I've met a couple of them, but I. And so, when you're fifteen. It's hard not to believe the world isn't coming to an end when that one person that you loved, that that person who rode up on that white horse and and pulled the you know the the faceplate up on his on on his helmet and he said, "Madame, may I help? I, you know it's just hard to realize that guy's gone now." Or that that girl that you rescued from the castle is, you know, now she just wants to be friends, and she, and you got to watch her dating the waiter in the banquet hall. Uh, you know, it's. I'm probably overdoing this, Wanda. But I was probably broken up with more than most people. <laughs> I I mean, you know. 
I had some guts when I was that age, I guess, because I, I look back at pictures of me and I, I looked really goofy. I probably look really goofy today, but but I had guts. I you know I would ask, and you know some girls sometimes would take pity on me, and I would go steady with them for like three days before you know, they uh, gave a note to a friend to hand to a friend of mine to give me, saying that they would just like to be friends, and you know that they were breaking up. Um, okay, here's what I think. I think that you can. Sit with your daughter and you can say, you know what, I know that you don't really, you can't really understand what it's like to be 25 or 30 because you just had not had the experience yet, right? But if I could tell you kind of how it's going to be like when you're that age, you know, one of the things that you will look back at at 25 or 30, you'll look back and you know, you will have dated several different people. And and I, I hate to say this, but this is going to happen probably a couple of more times to you. And there's probably going to be even more times that you're going to break up with a guy and he's going to be just uh, horrified and, you know, he'll be in tears for a week. And um, But time... Passing, not not only heals all wounds. When you look at, uh, at your high school life and and you're thirty and you go to that ten year high school reunion that, or whatever it is when you go, I, how old are you? I don't know, twenty seven, twenty eight. When you go to that high school reunion, it's amazing how time has brought everybody that was scattered across that, you know, there, there are these extremes in high school. There's these really popular kids, and then there's these really unpopular kids. And, and right in between somewhere is the druggies and the jocks and the, uh, you know, the really smart kids and, and the kids that are ordinary. I mean, me, I, I was one of those kind of people that was – Probably a little lower than the middle, okay? I, I went through high school and nobody ever even knew I was there, I think. Um, and so to be able to explain that when you get 10 years past it, you get 15 years past it, all those extremes come to one plane. And you, you come together and you see that Wow, that kid I don't even remember has now started a company worth millions of dollars. Wow, that kid who was so smart and so arrogant in high school, he's pretty nice now. And, uh, you know, he has a job in an accounting firm in town, and he's, uh, you know, one of 30 accountants. And then there's that, uh, you know, really popular kid that was the quarterback, and and, uh, you know, uh, he didn't play in college and he didn't play in the NFL. And, uh, you know, he went to community college down here and he, I mean, it's just amazing to see, you know, the bully, uh, you know, boy, boy, he's very nice and seemed kind of embarrassed to be around everybody because time not only heals all wounds, time wounds all heals. <laughs> you know, when people people are, are jerks, after a time, I mean, they they come to be wounded by their behavior as well. And and most of them kind of come back to the center and they, you know, they come back and they're not like uh, Biff in Back to the Future. They don't stay bullies in their 40s, you know. Um, and so to be able to explain to your daughter, Wanda, that this is part of your story. This is part of the story that your life is becoming. Your life is a song. And when you listen to songs, you listen to sad ones, you listen to happy ones. You know, life, life is like a musical score. It's up, it's upbeat, it's, it's down, it's dramatic. It's very lighthearted, and sometimes it's dark. And yet, 
there is a a a a, a building to a, a a great point that this musical score that your life is becoming and all these experience your all these experiences you are having now while some of them you would never choose they will come together to make the person that is you that can help another person going through what you've gone through you know how I, I guess and you can tell her this, Wanda. You you can say, I guess the, probably the most effective, most valuable person in the world has to be the person who has gone through the most struggle and the most uh, you know bad things in their life that they wouldn't have chosen because that is the person that can appeal to anybody that can really sit down with anybody in the world and help because they know what it's like. You know, there's no real answer for this, Wanda, but the fact that you care so deeply and that you're searching for the, the, the way with your daughter, you'll find it. Appreciate your question. Appreciate it. The time, and I will be thinking about you, and I'm sure there's plenty of people who will say a quick prayer for your daughter, okay? I'm Andy Andrews, the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. The professional noticer sponsored this week by Tucker ATV. And a variety of the power sports will just blow your mind there. The Hustler Turf Equipment, entire line of Echo Power Tools, and, of course, the Polaris Vehicles. But Shannon and Lisa Tucker, one of them will greet you personally. Maybe both of them. They treat customers like family, which is why folks from 14 states do business with Tucker ATV. You need to go to the Tucker ATV Facebook page. And um, if you're headed south... Veer off, head to Highway 43 North in Jackson, Alabama. Tucker ATV, the small town business with a national reputation. Our next question is from Darla. She's from Michigan. Let's listen. Hi, Andy. This is Darla from Michigan. I got to see a glimpse into your behind the scenes world with your Facebook Live video. I'm specifically referring to the one where you were in the studio recording the audio to your new book, The Bottom of the Pool. That process and think everyone would like to hear your answers to the questions I have. So here goes. Do you set specific time aside for narrating your audio versions or just pop in every now and then until it's done? And who recorded the video we saw on Facebook? Was there anyone else behind the glass? Do you often or ever make mistakes when you're reading? What happens when you do? I listen to all of your books on audio, so I couldn't help but notice that you personally read all your books. By the way, I especially love your narration of the Heartmender and of the Noticer Returns. I have heard you describe the difference between a talent and a skill. You're obviously great at this. You have an amazing ability to read in a friendly, endearing manner. So when you are recording a book for audio, do you consider your ability a talent or a skill? And I know I have a lot of questions, but please, one more. Why don't all authors read their own books for the audio versions of what they write? Thanks, Andy, for taking the time to answer. Darla, wow, these are great questions. And I actually love talking about this stuff because I love doing these audiobooks. I actually listen to a lot of audiobooks and, and, uh, you know, I always have a book that I'm reading, like the print holding, and I have another book going on audio. I, I, this is, I guess, a, a great thing for me because. I can do two books at a time. I can listen. You see, you know, I hear people say, well, I haven't got time to listen to audiobook. Really? I listen to it when I'm driving down the street. And I'll listen, you know, I'll listen to it two minutes at a time, 25 minutes at a time, 15 minutes at a time. And that's just, I mean, it's how you read a book, I guess. And so that's kind of how I do an audiobook. But I love doing these. And so here, I'm, I've got your questions. I jotted them down as you said them so I could answer all your questions. But you say, do I set aside a specific time for the audio versions or pop in every now and then? Actually, we do set a, set aside a specific time. It's kind of a big deal. You know, I mean, it, we see it on the calendar when it's coming because it's set two or three months in advance. And um, 
uh, Gabe, Gabe Wicks, the, he is the, uh, the Harper Collins honcho over all the audio. I mean, liter- literally, he produces three or four hundred audiobooks a year. Uh, but I just love Gabe. Gabe is just such an awesome guy, and we have become friends over the years. And so when I do my audiobooks, Gabe comes in. I mean, he doesn't I actually, you know, obviously he can't come in for all the audiobooks he's producing, but he comes in and he, you know, works with me in doing them and stays there the whole time. So we set aside two days and uh, the, the, the studio that we do them in is uh, Spotland Studios and Spotland's recording is uh, this awesome place owned by this awesome couple, and it's the only studio in Nashville that is only spoken word recordings. And so it's it's an awesome place. And the guy that is on the board, he's like this genius guy on the board, is Ben Holland. And I'll tell you a secret about Ben. Uh, he, he and Pam, his wife, own the place. And uh, he is the voice of all the Max Lucado audiobooks. He's the voice. And I, I mean, I, you know, I'm in there talking on the microphone, and there's a guy running the board that has won an Audi for, uh, for being the voice on one of Max Lucado's books. And so it's, it's, it's funny to me. An Audi is like a Grammy or a Tony or a, an Oscar or something that's in the audible book thing. And so, uh, you know, I wanted to get get him in the studio, and I'd say, well, I have here Max Lucado. And if people just listen to his books, they wouldn't know any difference, right? Um, but but Ben is in there, and uh, Gabe is in there, Emily's in there, and it's very important that I don't have a sore throat. when I Because one time, we had the, the whole thing set, and I went to Nashville, and we got in the studio. We did like 15 minutes, and Gabe said, this is not working. And I was like, man, it's not. And I'm so sorry because they have the studio booked and paid for. But um, you said who recorded the video we saw on Facebook? That was Emily. Emily Sweeney is is one of my guys. Uh, <laughs> Emily works with us, and she does a lot of the social media stuff. Emily and I work together. She used to be with Harper Collins uh, with their marketing division, and she was like head of that and. Then went to another big company that got her, and and so now, you know, she's playing with us, and so she is awesome. Um, you say, was there anyone else behind the glass? Yeah, I, I mean, I was on one side of the glass, and then on the other side of the glass, there's Ben that's on the board, and then Emily, who's over there kind of working on other stuff and probably making jokes with Ben and with Gabe, but then Gabe is following along with me um, because you asked, do I make mistakes when I'm reading and what happens when I do? You know, sometimes I don't know I have made a mistake and that's where Gabe comes in and Gabe, you know, Gabe will break in and um, and he'll, you know, I, I hear his voice. He'll go, hey, uh, you know, that is pronounced that word is pronounced so and so and so you know i i mean there's been times i (laughs) I have actually mispronounced uh words in my own book and and i i wrote it and so i'm grabbing another book over here i was gonna i was gonna tell you that he follows along and then yes i do make mistakes and sometimes i will ask him i'll say is that voice working you know, I'll stop and I'll ask Ben and, and Gabe, you know, because if I'm doing the uh, the voices, if I'm doing the, the narration and, and there's characters, like uh, you said you liked the Heartmender and you liked Notice of Returns, and I loved doing those, but I, I, I don't want to take somebody's attention away because I have listened to audiobooks that I just couldn't listen to because it just, it, they just drove me crazy. I get, you know, you listen to somebody and they're trying to do voices or they're trying to do something and it just sounds so distracting. You can't listen to the story. And so I don't want to get in the way of the story. 
you know, you 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 said that uh, you you asked, do I consider what I do a talent or a skill when I'm doing these books? And it's really both, I, I think, because I think you have to have a talent. I think it's a talent when your brain works to where your eyes can flow over something and you can you can go fast enough to make it, it, it you know that you can change your voice and I, I think that part is a talent but i think it's also a skill that that after you, after you realize you can read read that way or do that i you know you have things coming in your ear or in your eyes that are going out your mouth quickly that you're not really having to think about and so that part is a talent but but once you start understanding you asked down here why don't all authors read their own books for the audio versions of what they write i do like i I like it when an author does okay because i always i always think you know that is the real stuff that guy is reading what uh you know he the way he really intended it or that lady is is speaking the way that character was in her mind. I love I love listening to that. But uh, all authors don't have that talent. I, I mean, it, it's no big deal. I, I'm not saying that that talent is a big deal. A lot of people have that talent. Okay, not, but it's you know some authors don't. Some authors you know have that gift of writing, and it's. Just so great, and they. But a lot of authors don't do their books because they know that there are people that you know people who can do them better. And then there's probably a lot of authors that just make so much money that um, they think I can't be bothered with this. <laughs> I am not one of those, <laughs> but um, I love doing it. And and you ask what happens when I make a mistake. All right, I want to tell you that. Right now. Okay, Matthew. Uh, ooh, let's start over here again. Um, sorry for the hiccup. I want to tell you that right now, uh, we didn't edit that. I moved a little bit. Oh, the, oh, did you move? Mic position. Okay. You don't sound as like centered on it anymore. Okay. All right. Let me get over. There you go. Okay. I want to tell you that right now, we just had uh, an, an issue. I made a mistake, and then I was sitting in the wrong place. Now, what we did is we left it in there for you. Okay, but but watch this. Did you see that? We had, uh, you know, we moved around. I went and got a glass of water, but Matt cut all that out. <laughs> it made it sound like, we're so smooth in what we were doing. And so if I'm reading something, I picked up, I just picked up a book in my office. I mean, I will, I will do something like this. This is how it happens. The job was a promotion and Homer had earned it. He had commanded bull line ships for 20 years and he enjoyed a sterling reputation among mariners, fellow captains, his bosses, the Navy, and even the unions. The port job in Baltimore kept let me do that again. The port job in, I'm sorry, right? The port job in Baltimore kept Homer from having to face you boats. Okay, see, Darla, in a real life situation in the studio, all that would have been cut out and it would have sounded just like I never made a mistake. <laughs> you know, it sounded like I read through the whole book and I never goofed up. But, um, I love doing them, and and I I can do them fairly quickly. Gabe says that at first he was kind of aggravated with me because I said that I could do the book in two days, and he went ahead and booked three days of the studio because he said you can't you know there's no way you can do that in two days, but I did, and I I you know part of it is because I love doing it, so I really. I'm glad that you like listening to them. And also, this one's coming out, uh, The Bottom of the Pool, Thinking Beyond Your Boundaries to Extraordinary Results. It comes out, what, June 18th? When I did the audiobook a few weeks ago, you saw that on Facebook. When I did the audiobook, 
We also uh, recorded an interview about some stuff after we did the you know, did the recording, and so that will be an add-on with the audiobook. Something that people who buy the real book or the you know the hardback book is just be something different for the people that buy the audio. So. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, your question. I, I love talking about that. And um, I'm going to see you in the studio sometime, Darla. I bet you can do that. You're thinking a lot about it. Okay? All right. And I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing that tiny bit of mental energy I have for you. Seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, smile while you talk, shake hands with the kids you meet, and be sure to have an answer to the question, what is another word for thesaurus? And so, until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. Used paperbacks provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration provided by the Association of One Hit Wonders. They're on tour now and want you to know when the Association of One Hit Wonders comes to your town, you'll experience a concert with 20 hit songs, and all 20 groups will be there live and in person. Each group sings only their one hit song. Yes, because there is a 15-minute intermission between each group, the concert does last more than five hours, but you'll get to hear the knack doing my Sharona, Redbone with Come and Get Your Love, and Wild Cherry performing Play That Funky Music White Boy. It's the perfect way to spend an evening. 20 members of the Association of One-Hit Wonders in a theater near you very soon. You'll hear Spirit in the Sky by Norman Greenbaum. Dance the Macarena with Los Del Rios. And you'll get the Eye of the Tiger with Survivor. Not only that, you'll see the real Archies. Not the cartoon, but the real Archies. As they serenade you with Sugar Sugar. You'll line up and move to Achy Breaky Heart when Billy Ray Cyrus sings it and take a restroom break during Who Let the Dogs Out. That's the association of one-hit wonders. <laughs>